for all of us. Uh, my greatest prayer uh, throughout this week is we, looking forward to this morning is that we meet with God. I'm praying for you that you meet with God today. Uh, I know I've said it before a lot and have prayed a lot uh, here on the platform, but I don't want this to just be a thing that we come and do on Sundays. Uh, to come and sing some songs, uh, to shake a few hands, to hear a talk, and go home. But I pray that this would be a time where, when we leave here this morning, that we would leave saying, I've met with God. Not because of any person or because of anything that we did, but because you came into His presence, that you desired to hear from Him, that you desired for His Spirit to work in your hearts. And so that's been my prayer for us uh, as we've been preparing for this morning and for every single week. Before we begin, uh, let's pray for that. Let's pray that we would truly come before our God and meet with Him this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this opportunity to be here today. Lord, to be in the same building, to be in the same room, to be in Your presence. And Father, we know that Your presence is everywhere. Lord, that Your presence is not more real here than it is maybe at our kitchen table. But Father, You've still commanded us to not forsake meeting together. Lord, You've called us to assemble together and to meet with You together. Father, I thank You for everyone who's able to be here today. Lord, there's so many who have not been able to make it today. Father, we pray that whyever we're here, whatever reason brought us here today, that we would meet with You. Lord, that we would know that we've heard from Your Word and by Your Spirit, that we would leave here somehow changed. We leave here closer to you than what we walked in. Father, we pray. Lord, speak to each one of us. Lord, please speak to my heart as we need to hear from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about two different roads. Two different roads that you can very easily pick one or the other. But each road is going to take you to a completely different destination. When the Lord saved me in 1988, uh, it was within a year that I began to feel His call upon my life for ministry. And it was a call that, to be honest, I tried to run away from. Uh, it seemed a bit daunting to me and tried to wiggle my way out of it. But with that, that call eventually led me to go to, go to Malone College, uh, where I would begin my education, then to Ashland Seminary. And it was our first day at Malone that Julie and I met and developed a friendship that turned into a relationship, that turned into an engagement, that turned into marriage and turned into two amazing children and has found us here now at this incredible church uh, to serve the Lord together with you. And that's been a road that is one of the best decisions I made. But it's a road that I almost didn't go down. Because when I was a, a freshman and even a, a sophomore in high school, I was not going to go to Malone. Uh, my brother had been, he's been, been in the process, he had started Malone. And, and I, at first I thought about going there, but decided I wasn't going to go there. Uh, maybe it was part of me just saying, I want to do my own thing and go my own direction. But even a, as of 10th grade, I was going to the Moody Bible Institute. Uh, I was telling that to my friends. I was telling that to my teachers. That was my every intention, was to go to the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And suddenly God began to work in me and change my heart on that. And I thought this week about what my life would have been like had I gone to Moody. I'm sure it would have been a wonderful school, a wonderful experience. I would have met Julie would not have heard my life, would not have my two kids in my life. And realizing that as fine as that road may have been, it would have been a far less road. It would have been a far inferior road to the one that God has brought me down. Now, sometimes our choices in life can be very drastic, where one decision can make a huge difference in our lives. And sometimes those choices can be either really good or those choices can lead us down a road that heads to a very, very bad place. And a road that leads to our destruction. This morning as we come to 2 Samuel, we're going to see two different accounts. We're going to see lives heading in two completely direct, different directions. And we're going to see two completely different outcomes on that. The first thing we want to see this morning in chapter 12, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting at verse 24, here we see the birth of Solomon. Uh, we saw last week how Nathan had rebuked David for the sin that he committed with Bathsheba and the follow-up sin of having Uriah put to death. And then in, in verses 15 through 23, if you read that, you see that the, the, son that was, the child that was conceived in that relationship would eventually die. But now we come to verse 24, where we now have another child being born to David and Bathsheba, and this child's name will be Solomon. Where it says, And David comforted his wife Bathsheba, 
and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son. And he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him, and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now, it almost seems like a somewhat insignificant passage. It's simply saying, yes, Solomon was born, and they called him Solomon, and, but the, name, the, the prophet came and said, we well, should also call him Jedidiah. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if the choice is given to me, if you're going to give me a new name, either Solomon or Jedidiah, I, I think I'd stick with Solomon. Just, I don't know, just sounds better to me for whatever reason. But what we see here between verses 23 and 24, we actually see a, a gap of time. Because they don't go right from this child who would die right to Solomon. There's actually other children that are involved in that. We see in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5, where it says that there were born to him in Jerusalem Shimea, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. And please don't ever call me Shobab. I'd rather not have that name. But Solomon is the fourth now child, technically fifth child, but now the, the fourth born child of David and Bathsheba. So there's been some time that has elapsed from that. His name means peace. The name Solomon means peace. And that's very interesting because you think about the history of his parents and the background of the relationship between David and Bathsheba. It's a relationship that is probably defined in many ways. Now, one of them would be peace. A destroyed home, a destroyed life, a mess, shambles, dysfunction. Those types of descriptions go quite well with the situation, but peace is not one of them. But out of the dysfunction and sin that, that gave birth to the relationship between David and Bathsheba, we see now this son. His name is Peace. We see something coming out of the dysfunction of this relationship. But what we see in this relationship, what we see in the births of Solomon is that grace will always win. Grace will always win. If we choose the road that is defined by the grace of God, the grace of God will always win. That out of our brokenness, out of the mess that we make of our lives, God can bring about something beautiful. He can bring about a Solomon. He can bring about peace. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. A very profound scripture. It says, And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. You say, well, my, my life is so much better having now been introduced to Matthew 1, 6. So to know that we've got this statement of fact that David and Bathsheba gave birth to Solomon. What is the significance of Matthew chapter 1? Well, if you were to go back and look at it, you'd see that this is right in the heart of one of the genealogies of Jesus. Now, how many are grateful that the genealogies are there this morning? Those are kind of those chapters where you're like, okay, let me skip on to the next one. But if you were to look through the genealogies and actually look at all the different people who are part of those genealogies, you come across these verses. You come across the Matthew 1, 6s. Because when we think about the, the genealogy of Jesus, the line through which the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would come to us, you think that that would be kind of this family portrait of perfection, this family portrait of righteousness and holiness, and this undefiled line right down to us, giving us the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. But instead we get Matthew 1.6. You get David and Bathsheba. A relationship born in sin, a relationship marked by this dysfunction, a, a relationship characterized by murder and betrayal, bringing forth now this child of Solomon. And it's through this line that the seed of the Messiah is going to be passed. And we look over and over throughout these genealogies, and what we find in these genealogies aren't these, this hall of faith, this collection of saints and the, these wonderful holy people. What you find is this lineup of dysfunctional, messed up people. And it's through this line of dysfunctional, messed up people that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes into the world. What does that tell me? It tells me that grace will always win. That tells me that out of brokenness, God can bring forth something beautiful. That out of brokenness, God can bring forth His purposes. That out of the messed up lives that litter the genealogies of Jesus, God can bring forth the Savior of the world. Here we see with Solomon, he's going to go on to be the, the king after his father David. He's not going to be a perfect king. Some might argue he's going to be a more messed up king than his father would be, but a king nonetheless. But there's an interesting thing said about him in verse 24. It said, the Lord loved him 
In fact, this is why the prophet says you should call him Jedediah. You know, his name is Saul, but his nickname would be Jedediah because Jedediah means beloved of the Lord. Beloved of the Lord. Now, it almost seems odd that a child born out of this kind of relationship would be beloved so much of the Lord. But again, that was what David and Bathsheba did. It has nothing to do with Solomon. That God is not going to say, well, because your parents were messed up, because your parents sinned, I'm not going to turn my back on you. Instead, the, the child born out of that brokenness is going to be the recipient of God's love, and in so many ways, a love that he doesn't deserve. But now David is still going to experience the, the, the grace of God as we continue on in verse 26. It says, Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it. Lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took the crown of their king from his head. The weight of it was a talent of gold and it was a precious stone. It was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount, and he brought out the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them toil at the brick kilns. And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Now, we pick up this battle over Rabbah once again. Now, this should maybe trigger your mind back just a couple of weeks because we're last told about this battle two chapter, uh, one chapter earlier in chapter 11. This is the same battle, the battle for Rabbah, where David is not out there leading his troops. David is back home relaxing. David is back home watering on his rooftop looking at women taking baths. That's what's happening while his soldiers are out fighting for Rabbah. And so now we're, we bring this back, we're reintroduced to this battle, still in progress, and the battle is turning in favor of the Israelites. And if you notice what happens there, that Joab was leading this charge against Rabbah, and they're about to finally win this battle. They're about to take the city, they're about to be crowned victors of this battle, and Joab does something very interesting. He says, wait a minute, before we finish this battle, before we win this battle, we need to get David out here. Because David needs to be the one who is seen as the leader of this battle. We need to see David as the one who has won this fight. And so somebody go get David, bring David here, so that when we take the city, when we win this battle, he can get the crown on his head. Everybody can sing his praises. Everybody can just shower blessings on him. He can receive all the spoil and everything from the city. Now, as I was thinking about that this week, everything in me was just screaming out, like, you've got to be kidding me. This should be the one battle where Joab says, you know what? I'm not letting David take credit for this. This has been a disaster from minute one. David had nothing to do with this. We're out here risking our lives. We're out here fighting. David's back just lounging around, having his own issues going on. We're the ones out here. Why in the world should we have David come here and take credit for the victory? But God opens up this door for David now to get the credit for this victory. For David now to get all the blessings, if you will, of, of conquering this city, all the spoils of the city. Remember, this is a battle that 99% of it is fought while David's off sinning, while David's off having adultery, while David's off having guys put to death. This battle is being fought. Who is the recipient of the spoils of the victory that's fought in his absence? He is. He is. God still shows kindness and grace to David in the midst of a disastrous situation, in the midst of a battle he did not deserve. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a sense of justice in me that says that's not right. That shouldn't be. But I think if we were to understand the grace of God, we can look at every single example of the grace of God and say, that doesn't seem just to me. That doesn't seem fair to me. The grace that God has shown to me, the grace that God has shown to you, there's nothing fair about it at all. That I sin, that I rebel against God, and instead of punishing me as I deserve, He punishes His innocent Son in my place? There's nothing fair about that. David is a man after God's heart. David's heart continually turns to God. He messes up. He does stupid things. Again, we saw David's life contrasted with Saul's life. 
Saul lived a life that was in rebellion against God, could care less about God. Every so often, he'd show this little glimmer of righteousness. But his heart was turned away from God. And we see the exact opposite in David. David is a man who lives for God, who loves God, who desires God, but occasionally will do some stupid things. But his heart continually turns back to God. Sometimes we have this idea that the first instant or the first glimmer of anything imperfect about us, God is just waiting to, aha, caught you, boom, crush you, and my plan is done for you. The grace of God continues to give us second chances and third chances. Now, we can't take those for granted, and David doesn't take it for granted. We saw last week in Psalm 51, he's not saying, oh, well, Lord, okay, I shouldn't have done that with Bathsheba and Uriah, so sorry. David grieves over his sins. But as we grieve over our sins, the grace of God is poured out upon us and His grace will always win. And it's seen here with David, with Bathsheba, with Solomon, with the battle over Rabbah. The grace of God, I think, is written over all of these situations in David's life. What we see is that even in the midst of the most dysfunctional brokenness, God can still bring forth beauty by His grace and His power. This morning, maybe you're here and you feel like your life is messed up. You feel like your life kind of fits that bill of just a dysfunctional mess. Maybe you've come here this morning, you just feel completely broken and shattered, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is. And you almost feel like, you know, I'm in such a broken place that God can't do anything with me. My life is beyond repair. There's nothing God can do in me. But the grace of God will always win. He can bring beauty out of your brokenness if you move towards Him. Because that's the decision that we face this morning. When we're in the midst of that brokenness, when we're in the, me in the midst of our lives being completely messed up, either because of circumstances or because of things that we did to mess up our lives, we have a choice. We can either go down the road of God's grace or we can go down the road of ourselves that we're going to look at in a second. When you choose the road of God's grace, the grace of God will always win. The grace of God can bring something beautiful out of that brokenness. And there are stories even here in our own church of people we could call up and say, talk to us about a time where in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of your pain, you turn towards God and God brought something beautiful out of it. There's countless examples of that. On Tuesday, I'll celebrate the, the not celebrate, that's the wrong word, but uh, the, the two-year anniversary of when my mom died. And for me, looking back at that time, that was one of the times in my life where I looked at this kind of road split off in two directions. Because in the weeks following that, you know, I, growing up, I never thought you know, I'd be the guy who, before I was 40, I lost my mother and would have to look at my two little kids and tell them that their grandmother you know, is out of their lives, that they wouldn't have their grandma to be there at high school graduations and weddings and all this stuff. And there's that window where I was like, you know what? Just go ahead, just give into self-pity. Just mope around. You lost your mom. You know, birthday time, you're not going to get that call at 7.30 in the morning. Just go with it. Just be depressed. Feel sorry for yourself. Because it feels good, to be honest, sometimes. You know, people are a lot nicer to you after you've lost your mother than they are other times. You know, there's all this love and just affection and attention. It's like, you know, just stay here. Just stay feeling sorry for myself. But in the midst of that darkness, God brought me closer to His heart. In the past two years, He's brought me closer to Him than I think I've ever been before. Now, I'm not going to go back and say, I wish that, you know, I wish I could go back. I'm glad it happened. No, I wish it didn't happen. I trade it for anything in the world, but I don't have that option. But out of that darkness, God has brought something so incredibly beautiful out of it. This morning, as you come here, this I don't know what maybe your mess is or what your brokenness in life or wherever you are right now in life. You have a choice. You can either go down the road of saying, you know, I'm just going to stay where I'm at. I'm just going to go with my dysfunction. I'm going to go with my mess, stay in my mess, live in my mess, just feel sorry for myself in my mess. Or say, Lord, I'm going to choose you. And I'm going to run to you. And Lord, I'm going to just throw this at your feet. And Lord, allow you to bring something beautiful out of this brokenness. But the other option was what we see in chapter 13. Not going to God in that brokenness, going our own way in that brokenness is where we get chapter 13. Starting in verse 1. Sorry, I skipped over uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 8-11. Uh, put that up there real quick as you turn. Uh, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. 
For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. You think about the Apostle Paul. In somebody who, whose life was messed up, it was dysfunctional, was persecuting the brothers and the sisters in Christ. And God took the brokenness of Saul's life and transformed it into something beautiful and sent him to become one of the greatest missionaries of the history of the church. But anyway, back to the other issue in chapter 13. What we're going to see here is that self will always destroy. Grace will always win, but self will always destroy. And it's this passage that makes us invite the kids down to junior church. <laughs> chapter 13, starting verse 1. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Abnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. <clears throat> and when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Send out everyone from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. She answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in all Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where would I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. So just backing up here, what we have going on here, we have Absalom, one of David's son, who has a sister Tamar, and they have a stepbrother in Amnon, who was a son from another one of David's, David's marriages. And it tells us that Amnon is suffering distress day after day after day because he's so infatuated and lusting after his stepsister Tamar. And so he decides to go to his cousin Jonadab, whose name, by the way, means Jehovah is willing. God is willing. And it says he's a very crafty man, and he, he helps Amnon develop this plot, this strategy, to help him get what he wants from his stepsister Tamar. It's very interesting, I think, that Jonadab's name is God is willing. It's almost as though he's, he's speaking as a representative of God, helping Amnon convince himself that what he's about to do is perfectly legitimate in the sight of God, even though Leviticus 18.9 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. And sometimes we read that and say, you know, why all these, all these different ways of phrasing it? It's a sister. But notice all these different scenarios. If she's your sister in any variety, direct sister, stepsister, whatever it is, all of it's covered under this verse. So despite what Mr. God is willing is saying, Scripture says the exact opposite. God will never lead you contrary to His Word. And God said in His Word, no, do not do this. But they devise this plan. Nevertheless, He's going to pretend that He's sick and she's going to come and give Him food. And in the midst of that, He's going to take advantage of her. Now, verses 9 through 13 give some people some fits because she kind of tries to talk him out of it. And people go, it seems to go in two different directions with this. 
on the one hand, it makes it sound like you know, she's not opposed to the idea. She just wants it to be handled correctly. And some say maybe there's feelings on her part as well. And other people say she's just saying whatever she needs to say to get out of this and get herself out of the situation. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter uh, which direction you go because of verse 14. He didn't listen to her. No matter what feelings may or may not have been there, she said no, and that's the end of it. But he continues on. He gets what he wants. He violates her. But then it goes on in verse 15. It says that Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Get up, go. But she said to him, No, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called the young man who served him and said, Put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So the servant put her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived, a desolate woman, in her brother Absalom's house. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Want to talk about dysfunction? Here it is, full force. Tamar has been raped, and her brother finds out about it. And her brother does what? Says, just don't say anything. Just keep it to yourself. Just ignore it. Just live in quiet. Absalom does nothing yet. He does nothing to bring this to light, does nothing to bring this to justice, does nothing to make sure that, that this is brought to light and he is dealt with. He harbors bitterness in his heart over this. And we're going to see why in just a minute. But notice also that David finds out that his daughter has been raped, and David does nothing. He's angry, but he does nothing. He doesn't bring Amnon to justice, doesn't do anything to make this right. He also stays in quiet over this. Uh, in the ESV Study Bible, the footnote says that David has lost his moral courage and clarity of judgment. After what happened with Bathsheba, it's as if he's just completely skewed his morals now. Uh, you can take that or leave that as you will. But uh, verse 23 says, After two full years, Absalom had sheep shears at Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has sheep shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. He pressed him, but he would not go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him until he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Then Absalom commanded his servants, Mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. So here is Absalom's solution. For two years, let me brew in my anger. Let me brew and plot this revenge against him. And so he decides, hey, I want to bring all of the king's sons, all my brothers and stepbrothers. We're going to go out to the wilderness. Sheep shearing. Just have a little fun boy's day out. But his plot is, I just want to get Amnon out there. And so there's kind of some questioning, why are you doing this? It's a little unnecessary. I just, I want all, I want everybody out there. He knows what he's doing. He wants to get Amnon alone. He wants to get him drunk. And he wants to have him killed. For two years, Absalom has been plotting this revenge, and his moment is now here. Amnon is killed, and they flee. In verse 30, <clears throat> while they were on the way, news came to David. Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, and not one of them is left. Then the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the earth. And all his servants who were standing by tore their garments. But Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, said, Let not my lord suppose that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon alone is dead. For by the command of Absalom, this has been determined.
from the day he violated Sister Tamar. Now therefore, let not my lord the king so take it to heart, as suppose that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon alone is dead. But Absalom fled, and the young man who kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. And Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come, as your servant said, so it has come about. And as soon as he had finished speaking, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and all his servants wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Ahimedad, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. Here's our second road. Where we have brokenness, where we have a mess, where we have dysfunction with Amnon and what he does to Tamar. And in response to that, Absalom decides, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to spend the next two years, I don't think he strategized two exact years, but it took him that long to figure out his plan, to figure out his strategy, to wait long enough for there wouldn't be any suspicion as to why he wanted to go out into the wilderness with Amnon. So he waits two years, brewing, fastering in his bitterness, his revenge, his anger. And that choice leads to the murder of his stepbrother. And that choice would result in Absalom himself having to flee for his life and go into hiding and live in isolation. When we choose to, in the midst of our mess, not turn to God, not turn to His grace, but instead take matters into our own hands, and try to figure things out on our own, clean up the mess by ourselves, self will always destroy. We will always make a bigger mess out of the situation. Let's uh, turn to Romans chapter 8 for a second. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. <clears throat> but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So when we have the choice in the midst of the mess of our lives, we can either choose to go towards God, or we can choose to go towards self. Now, we see what the flesh does. We see what self does. The end of the flesh is death. That applies to salvation, but also any other circumstance in your life. When we try to figure things out on our own, when we decide, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to get myself cleaned up, and then I'll go to God. I've got to iron out my mess, and then I'm going to turn to God. It will only lead to destruction. It will only lead to making a bigger mess out of your life. You will not see beauty brought out of the brokenness. You will see chapter 13 lived out in a different form in your life. You will see brokenness give birth, birth to greater brokenness. So here we have two stories, two roads that a life can head down. David and Bathsheba, a messy, dysfunctional mess. But that is a road that as we travel down that road by the grace of God becomes a story that brings forth Solomon. And that will be a story that brings forth the line of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. From beauty, uh, beauty out of brokenness. It's a road that points to Jesus. The other road is the road of the flesh. It's the road of Amnon and Absalom, which is a road that would lead to rape and murder and betrayal, which is a road that would lead to sorrow and hiding and isolation. It's brokenness to further brokenness. It's a road marked by self. This morning, in the midst of our circumstances, what is our choice going to be? 
do I take that? Do I live in self-pity? Do I live in despair? Do I just stay in this? Do I try to figure this out on my own? Or in the midst of this brokenness, in the midst of this pain, do I run to Jesus Christ and fall at His feet and receive His mercy and His grace? That is the only road through which beauty will come out of that brokenness. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word there, labor, in the Greek means weary, tired, exhausted, or to labor with wearisome effort. You don't have to raise your hand, but is there anybody here today who would say that if you if you're describe your life and how you feel this morning, that you are weary, tired, exhausted, or even laboring with wearisome effort? The word heavy laden there means to be loaded down with a burden. If you're here this morning, again, don't raise your hand, but can you say, I'm loaded down with a burden, whatever it is. What are you going to do with those? With the weary, with the tired, with the heavy burden, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to continue to carry it on your own back and just continue to try to work this out on your own? Or do what Jesus said and said, come to me. Bring it to me. Lay it down before me. John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Now, Jesus is saying, if you come to me to be saved, I'm not going to drive you away. I will save you. But do you think that's where God says, okay, that's enough. You know, come to me, I won't cast you out. But once you're saved, now if you come to me, I'm going to cast you out. You know, now that you're saved, now that you're my child, when you come to me and you're in a mess, I'm just going to leave you on your own to figure it out. Or does he continue to say, if you come to me, I'm not going to drive you away. Come to me. Sometimes we're afraid to come to him because we've made a mess out of life. And we're afraid to show him that we've made a mess. My kids do very, something, very, something very interesting when they eat ice cream. When they get an ice cream cone, I don't know how it happens if they have hot breath or what the, if they just eat slow, whatever it is. But they'll have this ice cream cone, and it just seems to melt the minute they put it in their hands. And so we'll look over. They've got this melty mess on their face. They've got drippy ice cream down their hands. The cone is getting soggy and falling apart. And guess what they're doing? Nothing. They're sitting in the silent panic. They're not asking for help. They're just panicked and just frozen. Rather than saying, help me, can somebody get Or just trying to lick the mess. They just sit there and look at it. Sometimes that's what we do. Our life is a mess. Our life is falling apart and we just freeze up and stare at it. We just hold on to it and we look at it. We don't know what to do. And Jesus says, give it to me. Give it to me. Lay it down before me. Let me clean it up. Don't try to. It, when, if my kids try to clean up their drippy ice cream alone, it, it gets messier. Jesus said, "You're not going to clean up your life. You're going to make a bigger mess. Just give it to me. Bring it to me." First Peter five seven says, "Casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you." And I love the word "casting." There it literally means to throw upon. Throw your cares upon the Lord. Throw them on the Lord. That's not usually what we do. When we come to prayer with our burdens and being heavy laden and we're tired and we're all these anxieties and things that we're carrying, we come before God and say, Lord, look, you know, see, now I'm going to go back holding it. See, Lord, show and tell. See, see, I'm going to keep holding it. That's not what Scripture's calling us to do. It's saying, throw it. The thing about throwing it is it's not easy to retrieve it once you've thrown it. God says, throw it at me. Throw it to before me. Don't just do this thing of, Lord, here's my problem. C, C, C. Okay, amen. Now I'm going to go off and keep carrying. He said, throw it towards me. Lay it down. Let it go. Let me handle it. Let me take that brokenness. Let me take that mess and bring something beautiful out of it. Why? Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Literally, you are the object of His care. God cares about you. You're his child. I say that because that's a difficult thing for me to process. You know, you talk about the holiness of God, the power of God, the wrath of God, all those things that I understand that. You talk about the fact that God simply cares about me as his child. That's where my, I, I can't quite process that. I think about my kids. When 
something is wrong with them. I want them to come to me because I love them. I want to help them through that. I want to take care of that situation. Do you think our Father in Heaven has any less care than I as an imperfect father has for my, have for my kids? God says, your life is a mess. You know it, I know it. We can try to pretend like everything's fine. We can come into church and put on our, our wonderful smiles, but God knows the truth, and we know the truth. God says, give it to me. He doesn't promise he's going to take all of our problems away. He doesn't promise he's going to make life a bed of roses and just an easy path to walk down. He said, I will take your mess and turn it into something beautiful. It might still hurt. You might endure in a difficult situation. There may still be suffering. There may still be trials. But I can take that brokenness and make something beautiful out of it. We have to come to him first. We've got to come and trust that into his hands. And that's the hardest thing in the world, to trust. See, that's why I do the show and tell with God. See, here's my problem. See, see. When I let go of it, that takes trust in him. That takes trust in him to say, Lord, you're going to make something beautiful out of this, not make it a bigger mess. See, in my own doubts, sometimes I think if I give this to God, he's going to make a bigger mess out of it. So I've got to hold it. And all I do is I head down the road of Abnon and Absalom. Not literally, but I just make a bigger mess out of my life. This morning, if your life is a mess, if it's broken, if it's dysfunctional, if you're weary and heavy burdened and, and under a load of care, what will you do with it? Continue to keep it to yourself and let it destroy you? Let it destroy you spiritually, emotionally, physically? We lay it down at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, here, I need you. Lord, you are the only one. It's only by your grace that anything can come out of this mess. Again, it's not saying that the, the problem's going to go away, but saying that in the midst of that problem, he can make something beautiful. We come before him and cast those cares down at his feet. Let's pray.